Hi there, friends. Good morning, afternoon, evening, depending where you are. Here I, where I am, it's 1 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time on September the 14th, 2019. I am Emily Windsor Craig, and this is History Reset, brought to you each Saturday by People's Internet Radio, whom I and others sponsor to bring valuable information to the public that corporate hierarchies refuse to divulge. This program is a public service, but you are welcome to please donate to People's Internet Radio to keep the people's truth coming at you and without commercial adverts. All right, you know, I I suppose you notice that we have come to a hiatus in events. Things have kind of come to a halt. And on the media, what's happening is they're talking about talking about talking about the process of talking. <laughs> okay. We're spinning our wheels. All right. We're spinning our wheels. And so today I'm, I'm looking at some things. Um, how do we figure out where we're at when things are kind of stalled? And the first thing we're going to find out is um, where defined and located in this soup of ideologies, okay, by identity politics. And that is neither an accident nor is it a casual possibility. Not only do the governmental authorities surveil us, and if you're targeted, they surveil every keystroke and every sound you make, and they've been doing that to me for a long time. But the angels and the ETs and the overlords and the Godhead and the intelligences over our head also surveil us. And the way they identify and classify us we little souls, little Ajiji human souls, and we're very tiny, is by, they can see our aura. And like a spectrographic analysis that you can do with technical equipment, they can see our auric colors. And by our auric colors, they can identify what ideology we identify with. And it's all about beliefs. It's not, at that level, it's all about beliefs. It's not about behavior. Now, the local governance and the local state and the local church and your neighbors identify you by your behavior, whether you're abiding or not law-abiding, okay? Whether you're nice or whether you're hostile, whether you're materialistic or whether you're, you know, friendly and giving. Okay, but at the cosmic level, each of us is identified by our aura of thoughts. So, if you have certain thoughts, you're connected to a certain identity. For instance, if you believe in the Trinity, all right, then you're part of a revealed covenant that generally is um, Vatican and re- reformed, reformed. If you don't believe in a trinity, but you're a Christian, then you're classed with the Masonic orders and their ideologies, their Christian groups, the Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, and Mormons, okay? If you believe in the Trinity, you're a, a Catholic or an Episcopalian or Orthodox, all right? And so your auric colors reflect that, and you get kind of stuck in the, in the pot or the, or the group with the beliefs that you have, the beliefs you have about doctrine identify who you are. Your beliefs about behavior identify what you are. All right? All right. So today I'm going to look at some summaries of tactics 
that have been put up, one by the Zionists, by the um, Franklin School, by Saul Alinsky, all right, and we're going to look at the methods that these belief systems have set up to intimidate and conquer the working class, all right. So I want to start with the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. And here is their do list. One, disinform so that the protocols are a conspiracy theory. Divide the masses by classes into 1% and 99%. Divide and conquer through immigration and racism. Replace Christianity with materialism. Funnel and concentrate all power to executives. Implement national health care, force vaccinate. Initiate world wars abroad, false flags at home. Co-opt state and local governments. Control schools to re-education by Common Core and the gay agenda. Concentrate all power, confiscate arms through gun control. Militarize the peace against the domestic populace. Control the press and discredit alternative media. Use media to foment distractions through entertainment. Assault Christianity, morality, and disintegrate the family. All right? That is the top-down agenda of the new world order that is being propagated and put to work by the rich men of the earth. So... Let's look at the next do list, and this one is by the Frankfurt School, and the Frankfurt School um, combines the work of Karl Marx and Freud, and here's their do list. One, create racism offenses, continually change and create confusion, teach sex and homosexuality to children, Undermine schools and teachers' authority. Um, set up huge immigration to destroy identity. Promote excessive drinking. Empty the churches. Create an unreliable legal system with the bias against victims of crime. Create dependency on the state and state benefits. Control and dumb down the media. Encourage the breakdown of the family. All right, so this is the value system of the rich people who want to conquer the 99%, the masses, in order to create a control system that works on everybody. Let's look at Saul Alinsky, how to create a socialist state by Saul Alinsky. One, health care. Control health care and you control the people. Two, poverty. Increase poverty level as high as possible. Poor people are easier to control and will not fight back if you're providing everything for them to live. Three, debt. Increase the debt to an unsustainable level. That way you're able to increase taxes and this will produce more poverty. Gun control. Remove people's ability to defend themselves from the government. That way you're able to create a police state. Five, welfare. Take control of every aspect of people's lives. Education. Take control of what people read and listen to. Take control of what children learn in school. Think common core. Religion, remove the belief in God and the government and schools. Class warfare, divide the people into the wealthy and the poor. This causes discontent and it's easier to take and tax the wealthy with the support of the poor. All right? So those are the methods that have been laid down upon the working classes that we have to cope with. And I'm going to use Saul Alinsky's, um, I'm going to sneeze, um, examples to talk about how we can reverse some of these methods. As you know, the current president in office has been working to reverse some of these methods. He's been bringing 
jobs back to the United States so that the unemployment level is uh, decreasing, but that's not solving all these other problems. The amount of debt is in increasing as we speak. Gun control is on the lips of every liberal, even though the guns that we can use lawfully are to protect us from our own government. Welfare is being distributed to the large mass of immigrants to make them dependent and to create the voter base that keeps that method going. The Common Core curriculum has been reversed in the state of Florida, but if you try to talk to young people today, they don't have much of a vocabulary, they can't make change, and they're not really interested in speaking to the older generation, which to me is the barometer that says Common Core teaches hostility to culture. All right, now religion has umpty umpty ump journals and bulletin boards and places where you can attack every doctrine, every belief, every practice, every procedure, every policy, every bit of dogma. You can attack all the churches now from every point of view incessantly. And that's what has been enabled online, okay? So that class warfare is not just about money. Divide and conquer has infused everything, all right? We are divided generation from generation, from color, from color, religion to religion. Um, we're divided over every thought we have. And as an older older fart, you know, what I find is when I express my thoughts to my children, they're offended that I have the temerity to have a thought different from their thought. And that is the divide and conquer that we are having to contend with in this atmosphere of talking about the process of talking incessantly, where Everything has kind of come to a standstill right now in terms of events. Fortunately, we haven't had a third world war yet. We haven't had another mud flood yet. We haven't had an Armageddon yet. And so we can be thankful that after half a century of being programmed with the propaganda that we're going to have World War III, we're going to have World War III, we, the working people, have resisted and have said, no, we're not going to do that. But we have to be able to identify the methods that we're seeing that represent totalitarian society. Now, one of the unfortunate realities we have to deal with are the, is the treaties that permit ETs to abduct and experiment on people. You know, the Griotta Treaty that Eisenhower signed allows people to be taken, kidnapped, and used, okay, by ETs. Eisenhower wasn't such a nice guy. He's the one who firebombed Dresden in Germany, which was a community of 100,000 Lutheran Christians, and firebombed them um, and slaughtered them. So when he signed the Griotta Treaty that says we can be abducted, he did it with an impersonal, I don't know if, if he even realized the outcome. But what happens in an abduction is that people are physically abused, just as in some government programs like MK Ultra Monarch and Montauk, okay? People are taken and experimented on as children, and if they're lucky enough to survive it, 
they have the emotional scars for their entire life. Now, I was abducted when I was nine, and what I got out of it was three implants. One came out when I was in my 50s, and one in my 60s, and I just I just lost another one, a little, little seed I'm going to have to have analyzed. So I don't don't have leftover problems from having been abducted, but a lot of people can't say that. All right? So what we have is government agencies that do not answer to constitutional law, who remain secret, and who, with their confidentiality, <clears throat> need to know, okay, uh, compartmentalization and classified information. Keep the most important information away from us, the people, that affect us every day. I don't know if you've noticed, but I've noticed that there has been uh, uh, a lessening of the chemtrails, at least where I am. They're not as, um, they're not as frequently, all right? The chemtrails poison the soil. The fluoride poisons the water. The aspartame, the sweetener that was um, developed by Searle, a big pharma corporation, and passed the FDA without adequate testing, was pushed by Donald Rumsfeld, who also reported the day before the 9-11 attack that $2.1 trillion was missing from the um, Pentagon. And so I kind of followed Donald Rumsfeld's activities, and I found there was another program that he was um, involved in, the DARPA program called Pegasus, um, in which there was a time travel project and in the 70s, and some... Young people got involved in it. Okay, Laura Eisenhower was one, and Andy Bashaga was one, and uh, Barack Hussein Obama was one that was also involved in this time travel program. And a looking glass chair was utilized to see into the different timelines that exist because the our world is affected by the Schumann resonance that is the magnetic engine that twirls the North Pole, right? And it's a vortex. And there are certain frequencies, certain precipitations where time, where time precipitates. So you can say there are 10 dimensions and there are 10 timelines that this world experiences. And they're at 396 hertz, 417, 528, 639, 741, 852, and 963. Those are the frequencies where matter precipitates. And so those timelines can be seen using technology, and that's what the... Um, Pegasus mission did was look into the timelines and it looked into future timelines and it determined who the future presidents were going to be between the 1970s and 2016. And so then it set about to make sure that those presidents actually got into office and that's how um, Barack Hussein Obama and, and Bill Clinton got into office because it was made certain by the Pegasus program. Very few people are aware that the Pegasus program's entire reason and functional goal was to rig all of the elections until the uh, final New World Order could be established here on this world. And the New World Order, with its methods, 
has not been established because the people have had the temerity and the balls to say no. So we have these timelines going on, these like radio stations, okay? Radio stations where we participate um, in our human format. It's a, it's a very, um, it's an interesting theory of operation. All right, so that's what Pegasus was designed to do, and that's what Donald Rumsfeld, Rumsfeld was in charge of. But when we came to 2016, and the powers that be, the rich men of the earth, as described in the Iron Mountain Report, the rich men of the earth came together and saw that the people weren't going for it. Then they created another plan, um, an alternative plan that we're in now to allow a certain certain forms of nationalism to exist for a, a while longer. And that's what appears to be going on now. We do have wars fomenting that were called for in a directive by Albert Pike in 1871. He not only set out three world wars, he set out who the opponents were going to be in each of the third, in each of the three wars. And the opponents in the third war, which is the one that we are constantly facing, of course, is the encroachment of Islam into the more uh, pacified and civil nations of Northern Europe. Islam has a peaceful component, but it also has a revolutionary component. And over the last uh, 1,400 years, as Dr. Uh, Warner points out in his history lessons about the history of Islam and society, over 1,400 years, Islam's aggressive um, partisans have eliminated 280 million Christians and Buddhists and Hindus in their drive to conquer the world with for Islam. A, one problem is that they've nearly effaced the skills and ability of Christians and Buddhists and so forth to establish peace because the methods that are used are basically the same methods that the elites are using to undermine all of society now in preparation for destroying national identities and replacing national identities with a single worldwide hierarchy government that with its um, artificial intelligence tentacles controls everything. I mean, if you want to see the new world order, look at China today with its social scores and its huge apartment complexes and its 5G everywhere. That is what is planned for the entire world to get people under control so that the rich men can remain basically in ownership of all, not only the means of production, but all lands and all productions, food production, um, everything. Control is their drug. Control is the drug of the new world order. And it is built on possession by um, uh, druggery, possession, obsession, and um, identity dominance. My identity has to be dominant. So we, the working people, are left with the task of, one, realizing that we are being deceived, we are being lied to by diverse disciplines. It's not just 
the media that are telling us stories. It's not just NASA and they're never a straight answer. It's not just geography. It's not just physics. It's not just nutrition. It's not, you know, it, our history has been tampered with. Our chronology has been tampered with. The rich people who already control the ability to finance one project and not finance another have worked in concert with a common agenda to control all of this world and all of its people under one set of rules, not laws, rules. They want rules. And as you know, if you've ever balked at a set of rules that diminished you and made you feel humiliated because they, they're, the purpose of the rule is to get you to submit, submit, submit. And workers who do the work get a little tired of having to submit. All right. So we have to think about, all right, if, if submitting forever is the only option we have, then what happens? All right. One of the things that we're not told about in this secret over, overseeing of the elites, we're not told how many people are disappearing by abduction. And David Paulides, P-A-U-L-I-D-E-S, looks into that, and he has found in the United States 45,000, between 40 and 45,000 people a year just disappear without a trace. And we're not told very much about mortality, okay? It's not very easy to find mortality information wherever you live. I happen to run into a graphic that really shocked me because 44,000 people in the United States every year commit suicide. And that is their response to being told they have to submit, 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 and they finally just give up. But an even larger number of people each year die from iatrogenic medical error, medical errors. The allopathic school, okay, makes 250,000 fatal medical errors every year. Now, I knew that the allopathic school depends on visits, procedures, tests, and, and drugs. But I had no idea that the medical ethic, remember Hippocrates, do no harm? Well, nowadays, a quarter of a million people every year are dying from medical errors. And that is another fact that is not well known. The elites want to diminish the world population down to a level that they can control absolutely that will submit, submit, submit to them. And notice the New World Order has the same way of thinking as the Pope, who says all religions are the same, okay, as Islam that says submit or be beheaded or be have this or that or something else do to you. Submit, submit, submit. And so <laughs> we who do not wish to simply and summarily submit like barn animals, like docile cattle in a paddock, have got to think about what are we going to do about this as long as we are still alive. Now, you look at me. What I can, I can confront the rich men of the world, rich men of the world, who with their infinite amounts of cash can discourage anything I want to do. They can immobilize me. They can impoverish me. They haven't been able to kill me, although I think they've really wanted to. 
hurry because I don't, I mentally, I do not submit. Mentally, you, you can't put me in a category of, well, are you a Catholic or are you a Protestant or are you a, a, a Masonic? You know, you go into the metaphysics so much, you should be a Mason or you're not a witch, you're not a this, you're not a that. What you call people like me is a patsy. A patsy is a person like Lee Harvey Oswald, who worked for both the CIA and the FBI, who's just trying to figure things out, just trying to figure out what's going on here. And you know, the death rate of patsies is very, very high. Patsies get taken out. You notice the number of tattlers and truth tellers and whistleblowers who worked for the Clinton administration, you notice they have a quite extensive list of patsies who tried to tell on them who are no longer among us, okay? I have a page on Facebook, Departed Martyrs for Truth, and recently I determined that about eight truth tellers per month are disappeared off, suicided or something, all right? The people telling the truth about the problems that need to be resolved due to corruption, due to misinformation, due to bad methods, okay. These people are taken out routinely. Now, how come I'm 75 and I haven't been taken out? I think God's been taking care of me, frankly, (laughs) because I should have been taken out. I've been studying and trying to figure things out ever since I was a little kid. And I find that bad methods are in use and at play in every discipline, in every vocation, in every arena of information, doctrine and dogma, and even myths and fables are accepted as the correct, the correct thinking by the peer-reviewed authorities. And that the real truth is held as either a conspiracy theory or as um, classified information or government documents. It's very, very difficult to get to the truth. But when you finally do, you realize that everything is a lie. I used to love to watch Lloyd Pye. He was, um, I guess he was a physical anthropologist. And he explained step by step by step by step by step how evolution was never possible. And he does this with bones and, you know. But the truth of the matter doesn't get discussed in anthropology, paleontology, or archaeology circles, they have this absolute belief that evolution is the only way that humanity could have begun, even though we have Sumerian cuneiform tablets that tell us the other story, which mirrors the story in the Bible and the story in the Urantia Okay. We are not told the truth about anything. So what are the truths that matter to our survival? All right. The first one is you have to control your own identity, okay, by what people know about you, what the government knows about you, and how conspicuous you allow yourself to be. One of the things that will keep me alive anyway is to be law-abiding, transparent, and out of of this scope of things. Uh Uh-oh, I have a... Hang on.
Whenever I'm whenever I'm doing my program, there is either a phone call or a knock at the door. Okay, nothing nothing worth to worry about. Okay, we keep our head down by following all the laws, even if we have to limit what we used to do. One of the things that I no longer do is go out in public very much because pu the public domain is where the false flag operations occur. So one of the things we do is stay out of the public eye. Okay. One of the things we do is we're studiously lawful. One of the things we do is we find out about the laws that apply to us and the laws that don't apply to us. And we live in a jurisdiction where that's manageable. I chose to move to a town outside of my usual cosmopolitan area because it's a little more manageable out here who I associate with and what I'm seen doing and how I'm perceived by the community. You know, I'm kind of odd. I've always been kind of odd. And so one of the things we can do to keep out of trouble is to be very, very friendly with a diverse group of people. Be, if you can't be friendly in the neighborhood where you are, try to find a different neighborhood because being friendly is how we stay out of trouble day to day. Operating by minimalism, only doing what you can do and staying out of people's space, minimalist, being modest, um, that's how we stay out of trouble. We want to stay out of trouble financially, not buying off more debt than we can chew. Um, we also need to think about the possibility that the financial system of the Fed is going to stop working at some point. And so in that case, we need to think about how we can survive without any money and for how long. This is a serious topic to give consideration to, and one that deserves the attention of a whole family group or a whole clan, okay? If the Fed crashes and a dollar is only worth a dime, what are we going to do about that? Are the children going to move back in with the parents? Are we going to get a trailer and go out into the country? What are we going to do? This is a good topic for families to be talking about not avoiding. Okay. I realize that this is an uncomfortable, an uncomfortable topic to have to bring up because we live in a culture where we want to make nice and be nice always. And we don't want to trouble our loved ones and friends with problems that are going to make them suffer. But right now, we don't want to be sitting ducks either. So we need to think about how are we identified in the public domain? By what ideological identity are we in the public domain? Is that in a covenant with a church or an ideology? Is that a social class? Is that a racial class? Is that, you know, where do we fit in and how do we fit in with the least amount of friction? Because friction is what causes problems. Let me give you an example. Social services has been tampered with. So now, although their mission statement is that they want to take care of children who are, quote, at risk, there are more and more jurisdictions in which the charges are made that children are removed from loving homes for trivial reasons like the parents smoked um, a, a 
a, a weed, you know, parents smoke marijuana, so they remove the children. Or uh, I saw a case where babies were removed, twins were removed from their parents because the twins were born at home and not in a hospital. You know, truly trivial um, trivial matters that a social worker can use to create an event that can become the basis for a profit gain by the bureaucracy. They sell the children in an adoption market and they make X number of dollars. Okay. There are places where children are being kidnapped from good homes and sold in the adoption market. Now, I was sold in the adoption market as an infant. And as a result, I have spent my whole life trying to figure this out. And that's how life affects us, and it does affect us. And that's okay, all right? Sometimes police are caught and accused of placing drugs or guns or some um, violation upon an innocent person in order to drag them into court and send them to a private prison and create an, an income, a profit gain out of framing an innocent person. This is not uncommon, right? How do the bureaucrats make get their um, their benefits and their promotions is by causing events to occur. So I guess one of the most important things you need to think about is to staying away from to stay away from bureaucracies and hierarchies that can make can victimize you one way or another. Those who are subject to um, Medi-Cal and the, all of the rules and regulations of the medical establishment in order to have any medical care whatsoever are between a rock and a hard place, and I understand that. I um, developed tumors in the adrenals 20 years ago and the medical establishment didn't help me. And so I dropped out of the system and now I only have a problem once in a while rather than all the time. This is one of the things you can do to keep yourself out of harm's way is to keep yourself out of the way of the bureaucracy. Keep yourself autonomous. Keep yourself independent, self-reliant. Self-reliance is not just an individual's achievement. It can also be achieved by a family, by a clan, or by an organization. And this is probably the piece of advice that I'm most likely to promote to everybody. If you belong to a bowling alley or a Boy Scout troop or a parish where the people are very tight, okay, Utilize that organization and that affiliation to all help each other in the group because you're a group in which there's trust is already existing. You already know each other. You already see each other a lot of the time. That is the place to build trust relationships in case things go south because they are programmed by the rich men of the earth to go south, to go to war, to go to chaos, to go to bankruptcy, to go to bad times. The methods in use by the leadership of the West are horrifically bad. They're not just a little bit bad. They're terrible methods. And so we the people have to pull ourselves together and replace their functions with our own abilities to share and care for each other. Otherwise, it's going to be very hard to make it through the tipping point, because you know there will come a tipping point 
when the system can no longer function because the methods, the bad rules, are breaking the system itself. That's what happened in the Soviet Union in uh, 1989 when the Soviet Union came apart. I don't know, you weren't around maybe in the 1950s when Pravda sounded just like the mainstream media today. and We were laughing at Pravda, the silly articles and the silly beliefs in paranoia, uh, paranoia and in um, uh, aggression and so on that were being published in Pravda during the 1950s. We who had free minds could laugh at the Russians for being so stupid to believe what they were being told by their mainstream media. And here we are now, half a century later, getting the same treatment as the Russians got from 1917 until 1980. They had their 70 years of mainstream media bullshit, all right? And now it's our turn. And if you look at who came through the, um, the mess in Russia, the communist scourge that Russia um, experienced? You find it, it was the self-reliant people who made it. It was the people of faith who made it. The Russian Orthodox Church has become stronger by a thousand times since the downfall of the Russian communism because the church pulled the people together. They've built 35 new cathedrals in Russia since 1989 when the Communist Party fell. Russian orthodoxy in the church has become very, very strong and it's practically the last bastion of Christianity in Europe and in the United States today there doesn't appear to be that sort of renaissance occurring because online in the religious, um, well, in the religious groups and religious pages, they're more focused on criticism and nitpicking doctrines and dogmas and nitpicking behavior, the Christian right, the Christian left, the Christian center on the internet are more focused on tearing the community fabric apart than they are to pull together and help each other. This is what I notice about the United States versus what's going on in Russia or Syria or Poland, where Christianity is taken seriously as a social movement for people to help each other. All right? That's why I'm saying to you, identity politics is very important with whom you identify. Now, if you're like a lot of people I know and you're atheist or agnostic, then what affiliations do you have to pull together when the economy and the social civic system goes south, when the legal system becomes unreliable, okay, when the social services become unreliable, then people are left to their own individual devices. And this is what the rich men want in order to defeat us by fragmenting and diffusing the people who, under other circumstances, could be autonomous. It's, it's a hard road to hoe here. Now, our environment is being attacked from every angle. The water has fluoride, the air has chemtrails and heavy metals. The food, the GMO food is designed to destroy the digestive system of not just the humans, but also the um, livestock that we eat. Right. And so another factor and feature that we need to take 
very seriously at this point is how to correct the deficiencies in the environment to keep ourselves and our families safe. If you're not in a 5G chem, uh, excuse me, uh, cell tower area, you're ahead. And one of the things that is happening is that people, enough people are objecting to the 5G rollout. It's actually being delayed and stopped in some areas. I live in a 5G area. I'm looking for a place to move to that's safer. All right. 5G, what it does, it explodes the water molecules in the body cells. So it's basically perforating you. <laughs> okay. It's a perforation of the human body is what 5G does that um, dries the body out. You have to keep drinking liquids all the time. And, of course, the liquids they want you to buy are the ones that are loaded with sugar and chemicals. Great. That's one problem. Another problem is the source of your food. Where do you get your food? Most working people depend a great deal on restaurant food, all right? They, and the restaurants depend, of course, on pro, getting produce from reliable sources. Fast food is not a reliable source, all right? So people who eat mostly out of restaurants are going to suffer from too much salt, too much sugar, and too much fat. It happens every time. What works better is to have somebody home who knows how to cook. And what works the best is old grandma's recipes, the simple food combinations that have kept people going for centuries and thousands of years. Protein complementarity um, is a concept that's taught in nutrition to enable a vegetarian, a person who eats primarily vegetable foods, to enable them to get adequate protein. You mix beans with rice and nuts with uh, wheat and corn with beans. Okay, and you can find protein complementarity. You can probably just Google that. And once you know how to combine your proteins and work from folk recipes, not fancy recipes. You'll be stronger and you'll do better. Okay, so we have to look at our sources of food. We have to look at the quality of the water that we're drinking. If you're drinking tap water, if you're in a hospital and you go to a drinking fountain and drink the tap water, it's got both chlorine and fluoride in it. It's not good for you. So one of the optimizing tactics that you can follow is to spend two or three hundred dollars and get a three-stage water filter that takes all of the gunk out of the water. So at least you're getting clean and clear water in your body. This is fundamental. You may need to have an air filter on the fans in your home if you're subject to a great deal of dust, auto exhaust, and um, chemtrailing, you may need to go out and buy an air filter system in order to cope with that. All right, um, there you may need to supplement the foods that you eat with specific remedies for specific problems. In my case, because of the adrenal polyps that I had, for years now, I've been having to take a great deal of magnesium as a supplement. And it's done wonders for me, and I understand that people who don't um, take the magnesium, who have the same problem that I have had all these years, do not fare very well. You have to know what your body is used to, what it needs, and give it give yourself what it needs. How do you know if you're getting from your supplements what you paid for? Um, as an old woman, I've learned to read my body signs. All right. When I get a heart flutter, 
Okay. Whoops. That's a sign. I did something. What did I do? All right. If you get a heart flutter, you did something to cause it. You've got to figure it out. One of the things that you can do to detoxify your body and keep your body clean is instead of taking showers, actually take tub baths with a half a cup of baking soda in the tub bath so your body can actually sweat out the poisons that you've accumulated during the day. Maybe that's why a lot of people tell me I don't look like I don't look my age because I've been bathing in baking soda baths now for about 15 years and it has really made a difference and I do all right I'm not rickety I'm not fragile um, I'm getting along okay and I keep very very clean that makes a big difference to the human body how clean you are all right um, what else can you do let's see clean air clean water clean body um, makeup okay makeup is made of chemicals we don't need it well of course at my age I haven't worn makeup in years but that makeup and um, cosmetics are a source of biological contamination so that's something that we can minimize you know you minimize stuff you minimize the stuff in the closet you minimize the stuff in the garage you have a garage sale and you unload and you unload and you unload this is a healthy thing to do is to have your garage sale in your flea market and get rid of stuff and accept a minimum of belongings because hey the day that I pass from this world the things that I own become a burden on my children they're not they're not help anything so think about when you leave and we all do leave think about what you're gonna leave behind and get rid of the stuff that nobody's going to want Right. Say, Emily. Say, Emily. Yeah. Are you ready for a break now? I'm ready for a break now. Yes. Let's have a break and some music, some lively music, Enigma or something. Enigma. I don't know. I don't know who that is. Okay. Well, I'll um, I'll dig up a copy for you, and uh, you'll find out. So I'll see you what in about five minutes. Uh huh. Okay. Five minutes. Thank you. Yeah, let's take care of our futures, not just our present. And I realize this is a problem because everybody's so busy. What on earth? Where is that music? You still have your radio player on. Oh, okay, it's gone. Okay. Uh, and that wasn't Enigma. I don't know what that was. Um, we have to take care of our futures and not merely our present. And this is a double whammy. Um, in my young years, I got to stay home with my children. And I was the mom and my children went off to school and I took care of things at home. This, this today is very seldom even possible because both parents are working and sometimes both parents are working more than one job. This is part well, of the agenda. What? what? It is. It is still possible, though. It's just that people people have to sacrifice a lot of things. Yes. You have to, and you have to learn what to sacrifice. That's the difficult part. And that's why I put together the book, um, Sheltering Necessities, because what to sacrifice is the consumerism and the, um, what do you call it, retail therapy of the current system. Retail therapy is how people are snagged into more debt than they can handle. Another way people are snagged into more debt than they can handle are these uh, education loans. Um, kids um, leave school and they have a lifetime of debt 
they have to deal with before they have even bought a home or a car. That didn't exist when I was young, and I'm very grateful that it didn't, okay, because debt is what saddles us. Now, in the Jewish and the Judeo-Christian culture, there's a concept called the Jubilee, and during the Jubilee, everyone is forgiven all of their debts, and we go back to zero and start with a new economic system over again in ancient Israel, that was law. But in today's Zionist Israel, that's not what's going on. And people are saddled with a huge amount of debt all over the world. The, the debts at this point, I believe, are greater than the value of everything that exists. <laughs> okay? All right. That's a problem we have to work around and one of the way, there are, there are some um, tactics and strategies that we work, one, to live on less than we make. That's called minimalism or, you know, uh, live on a modest means. Another th tactic that we use is seed money, the power of ten. I don't know online whether you've seen returning the favor with Mike Rowe or on uh, Twitter, there's a guy, Bill Pulte. And these are men who are spending their lives teaching people how to create their own wealth and how to give back to the community um, and to cope by giving and not just by taking, 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 taking. This is a very um, productive and useful strategy that young people are not um, exposed to, except under very uh, exceptional circumstances. Seed money, the power of 10, is how to create your wealth by what you give out. Because remember, the cosmic law is you have to reap what you sow. And so if you're giving seeds and if you're giving seed money, what comes back to you is 10 times what you gave out. And so that tactic I have included in one of my books, uh, Let Your Know Me Know. Let Your Know Me Know is the uh, book I put together with all of the tactics and strategies that I could even think of that would enable uh, a person to get out from under s simply submitting over and over and over again to the um, debt-based capitalist system. We're not just victims here. We have the option and the opportunity to think differently and to do differently than the system does. And I don't know if you notice. But we all meet people who have somehow broken the mold and done something quite exceptional and have created for themselves self-sufficiency and autonomy. Those are the people we need to learn from, not the ones who are dividing us into identity politics. We need to learn from those who are doing who are doing well because they're taking care of others, because they're doing good for others, because they're giving. Their giving is coming back to them. And um, and so let's, Let Your Know Me Know is the book that I captured as many ideas as I could about how to become self-sufficient by being very wise about what you give out. Great. The other book that I'm referring you to is Sheltering Necessities, which is a longer term view of one's life in which the polluted environment means we need good, clean, organic food. All right. So the natural alternative 
is to is to farm our own groceries. Unfortunately, today, a backyard um, a backyard garden is subject still to chemtrails, air pollution, and the heavy metals falling from the sky. So, in sheltering necessities, I have taken. Uh, Mr. Brown's book that he um, wrote back in the 70s when he built himself a pyramidal greenhouse um, and grew his own giant groceries in his own backyard. And you can see that it's a doable deal. And the pyramid greenhouse screens out all of the pollutants that are in the chemtrails and uh, not that are in the water. You've got still have to have a, a water filtration system. All right. The second part of that book has to do with personal health from the empirical point of view as in Ayurvedic medicine of the Indian people in India and the um, Chinese and Oriental people's version of good health and nutrition. You know, 1.4 billion Chinese can't be wrong when it comes to food. So the second part of sheltering necessities is about personal health from the empirical. How do we test our own health to see whether we need to do this or that, whether we need to choose this or that, all right? And the third part of the book which is really an extreme case, is how to build your own backyard bomb shelter. <laughs> okay, It was written anonymously and placed online anonymously, and so uh, it has no copyright. Anonymous cannot copyright anything. So I made a, a copy of this, of this uh, how to build your own bomb shelter and put it in sheltering necessities. So anybody um, with a will and some construction talent can do it. And the bomb shelter only cost about $600 in materials because it was mostly sandbags. All right, so that's the two books I have um, the links up for today. And I'm always trying to find more books to provide for people from the past that are better than the ones we have today. I have um, an arithmetic a drills book for seventh graders. There's just a little bit of a book, but it's got wonderful drills to sharpen the mind of any young person who wants to know how to figure things out in their head and not have to use a calculator. All right. And I've got a, a book by uh, Dr. Bates about how to um, have good eyesight without glasses. All right, and I have six books on um, crochet. Why crochet? Why would anybody want to crochet? Well, let me tell you. In hard times, in order to make, uh, in order to produce a garment, you have to have a sewing machine. You have to have, and all the tools available. You have to have fabric that's available to you, all right? And you have to have electricity. Those three things take to make a garment. But if you have a hook and some twine, you can make anything. You can make your slippers, your purse, your suitcase, your hat, your underwear, your bathing suit, your coat, your jacket, your suit. You can make anything with a hook and some twine. And that's why... I collected and finally published six books of crochet patterns to enable particularly cottage businesses, home businesses, to you know, make things at home and sell them at the local flea market or sell them. Um, I wouldn't sell them in a garage sale because crochet actually um, is a, a high skill that... Um, commands good prices, really good prices, once you know how to do it. So that's why I have so many books at Amazon, because a lot of them are skills books 
of skills that are being lost in the consumer market of retail therapy of the cheap, 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 super cheap um, fashions that you can buy at Walmart but only last one season. A crocheted item will last 50 or 100 years because every stitch is a knotted stitch and they don't come apart very, very well. All right. This is part of being self-sufficient, is knowing the skills that are going to enable you to step away from retail therapy, to stay, step away from indebtedness, to step away from the high cost of eating in restaurants, okay? The high cost of shelter um, in real estate transaction these days. I don't know if you've noticed the tiny house movement on the internet. It's amazing what people are designing in their backyards, and sometimes they're mobilized, sometimes they're not, but a tiny house usually is about 7 to 10 feet wide, around 30 feet long, and 15 feet, I believe, is, is it's got to be able to go under bridges so it can't be any taller than a, uh, a truck trailer, okay? Uh, it basically, it's, it's the trailer, the size of a trailer on the back of a truck, except it has a house in it, all right? And a person can live in it. And they don't have to pay um, real estate taxes, and they don't have to pay on a mortgage because they buy it out of the cash that they have available so they don't go into debt. The, the one caveat on having a tiny home is that you have to be extremely neat. Living in a tiny home, there's really not a whole lot of place for a whole lot of possessions. And the tiny home movement is teaching minimalism to a whole generation of young people who don't want to be saddled and have to submit to mortgage payments for their entire life long, okay? This is an option that provides a measure of freedom you don't get most of the time, all right? We're looking for options that provide us freedom from having to submit, 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 submit. Okay, we don't want to be among the 44,000 people who are giving up and offing themselves each year because life has become so absurd. But when you look at the amount of debt that people are carrying and the amount of work they have to do just to get through the month of bills, it's really discouraging and almost scary. This is why the church can be essential to people's, to our um, sense of balance and sense of integrity in a difficult world. Because yes, life is very, very difficult right now for intelligent people who are being squeezed from every direction. If you look back at those bad methods that I talked about at, at the beginning of the first hour, you notice that the people who are most victimized by the bad methods are people who are careful and conscious of their needs and are trying to do good. Those are the people who are victimized. Those are the people who are taken out. It's the troubleshooters and the whistleblowers who are being disappeared and taken out. And so, you know, there, here is where wisdom comes, becomes necessary in living our lives. You know, I haven't heard the word wisdom spoken in the national media or on the internet ever. The word wisdom. Who, who even talks about wisdom anymore? Because even the people from the churches are talking about their doctrines and their dogmas and their beliefs, okay? 
but wisdom hardly hardly gets noticed anymore. And so that's why I do this, because my generation got to listen to a, a, a another generation 50 years younger than I was that had achieved some wisdom. They had some equanimity, even though they had been through the Russian Revolution themselves. They had a sense of dignity. They understood what dignity was. They didn't see everyone making ridiculous comments about everyone else. They didn't see divide and conquer as the way to be in the world. And that's what sets me apart from this generation is that the generation is so addicted to divide and conquer according to beliefs, according to ideology, that some dignity and some peace of mind is only possible if you get into avoidance, okay? There are the folks who get into, I'm just going to do my own thing and I'm not going to worry about the rest of the world because the rest of the world's driving me crazy, all right? Yeah, you can do that. But the rest of the world needs your attention, too. And in order to have some calm, a place in this madness that doesn't drive you crazy, we need to pursue some specific techniques to keep ourselves on an even keel. You know, I already talked about my baking soda baths, how those help me just unwind and feel so much better. Detox, okay. And the um, magnesium supplements I take help my system eliminate. And I have other herbs for elimination. There's cayenne pepper, and there's valerian root that drops my blood pressure. You know, there are uh, St. John's wort um, when I get a little too tense, all right? There are these herbs that really help calm things down that you don't have to have a prescription for. You don't have to pay large amounts of money for them. Um, they aren't controlled substances. No, I do not use weed. Because as a targeted individual, and I've been targeted since birth because of who my father was, I've been targeted. So I cannot use weed. If I did, um, I would be subject to more than just surveillance. They would, you know, they would have something on me if I did. So I wouldn't dare, right? Um, another thing that helps, and earlier I, I talked to you about those sulfidio frequencies, you know, the 396 and 417 and 528 and 629 and so on. Um, those frequencies, sometimes they're a pure tone and sometimes they're mixed in with sounds like the ocean and sometimes they're mixed in with music. Those frequencies can help the body to calm down also, right? And it's a matter of trial and error of selecting the frequency that you need right now to calm your system. I was, I've been messing with 417 for months now and it wasn't doing anything for me anymore. So now I'm up at 963 and it feels marvelous, you know. It's like taking a walk, okay, taking a walk. Um, is essential for somebody my age. You know, I have a little dog, a little um, Shih Tzu. Her name's Percy and she's 12. And she's just a little bit of a thing. And, and sometimes she does a little happy dog dance when she wants to take a walk. So we walk three times a day. So I walk probably a mile, mile and a half every day. And that helps maintain the balance that my body needs to um, not experience a great deal of discomfort or pain anywhere. Okay. Uh, Arthritis is not a problem of mine. 
because I learned long time ago about acid base balance, you know, our joints become rigid and filled with calcium deposits when they have to be protected from the acids in our a circulatory system. All right. So I acid base balance my diet. And that goes back to the recipes that I use for cooking my food. So because the beans are alkaline with the rice, which is acid, and the greens are alkaline with the, um, the cheese, which is acid. And I acid base balance my meals consciously, deliberately to keep my body's acid base balance in the slightly alkaline state, all right? I don't know if you know this, but a lot of people know this. Cancer is acid. Cancer is too much acid in the body. Cancer is a combination of acid and fungus, okay? And so I guess it was a half a century ago I began acid-base balancing my diet. Now, if you don't know enough to start doing that on your own, search for a macrobiotic cookbook. Now, I know you're not going to love the food at first. You're not going to like uh, uh, tofu this and this beans. and you know You're not going to like it at first, but what you can do is adapt it to the ingredients that you use to put together a meal, all right? That's how I use the macrobiotic cookbook because I didn't care for umbioshi plum paste and, uh, and a lot of rice. I just, can't, I just can't do that. But you have to have the time and ability to cook for yourself or to know which restaurant has the food that you thrive on, okay? I have developed an awareness of ethnic food. Mexican food makes me feel wonderful. I love Chinese food, but it sends my blood pressure through the ceiling, right? Um, Indian food, which I don't have um, much opportunity to experience, is different. I can't trust, I can't rely on its effects. All right. This is how we come to balance is by paying attention to every detail of our existence, every possession, every garment, every detail of our existence can be brought into a self control situation of um, thriving the individual. And this is part of the adaptation to a world in which we're bombarded, literally bombarded and barraged with selling information 25 hours a day, nine days a week. It's good to develop and devise a strategy against ads, against advertising against promotions, against uh, people who want your money before you have a chance to use it, if you see what I'm saying. So those are the options that we have to resist the command and the rule that we submit, submit, submit to somebody else. We learn how to submit to our own biology, submit to our own desire to be wise and experience dignity and experience balance because our own self-study takes us where we want to go. In the past, the way people self-studied their own responses and reactions and practices and habits was by journaling. You know, everybody journaled a hundred years ago. Everybody had their diary where they taught themselves from their own problems, from their own questions, 
And a few days later, the answer came, and then they recorded the answer to the problem, and they never had that problem again. Journaling and diarying, yeah, having a diary, um, I don't think it works as well using a tape recorder spoken because we don't tend to go back and listen to what we said again and again and again. That doesn't help very much. But having it neat in a, an open lined um, book of lined paper and being able to re reflect back on what happened a, a few days or a week ago and make a list for what is going on tomorrow. Lists and diagrams, the diary is one of the best tools that exists for a person to come under their own self-sovereignty and self-control and take care of their own future and take care of their own responsibilities. Okay? So that's where I'm going to leave it today, Steve. With I'm the here. diary, with the diary and the self-study and the observations that everything in our environment <laughs> is, because I'm going to start coughing, everything in our environment is a candidate for being corrected, for being adjusted. And if we're in an environment where everything is adjusted and corrected for us under some kind of rule, we are vulnerable to burnout, we are vulnerable to discouragement. We are vulnerable to despair. And so I want to uh, encourage everybody to take your life, grab your life by the horns, and take charge of what you know, who you know, where you're going, <laughs> where you're sleeping and where you're living, and, and who you have to interact with. Take charge of all of it. And um, make yourself happy because nobody else is going to do that for you. <laughs> nobody else um, has the responsibility to thrive us or make us happy or even to keep us safe, if you can believe that. So this, um, this is Emily Craig, and it has been <laughs> History Reset for Saturday. <coughs> Next week, I'm going to carry on to look at options. <clears throat> and I'm going to look at communities. Because in the United States, there are 500 intentional communities. <clears throat> There's actually a magazine of intentional communities in the United States. There are also What's 500 it? tribal lands. And there are a bunch of... Um, What's an intentional community? Pardon? What's an intentional community? Intentional community is a group of people who pull themselves together and decide to create a place to live for a clan. Uh, and they're all across, there are 500 of them all across the country. There's a, a, a directory of intentional communities in Communities Magazine. Uh huh. huh. And so that's one way to drop out of the primary. Um, Shop until you drop. Retail therapy, <laughs> Cons society, consumerism. Yeah. yeah, consumerism is to join an intentional community, tribal properties, convents, monasteries, and communes. Because a commune is different from an intentional community. A commune has one business, and everybody there does that works in that one business. But an intentional community can just be a bunch of people who cooperate together and coordinate together, but they're not, they all do different things. But in a commune, you have one business and everybody is into that one business. But it is a relief from the suppression and subjection and uh, submission to a top down federalist. Um, totalitarian government it's a different set of rules it's still a set of rules but it might be a little bit more comfortable than totalitarian capitalism 
because in totalitarian capitalism, the corporations write all the rules and the people just just have to be subject and submit, submit, submit to everything. I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> Perfect. I hope so. I hope so. So um, <clears throat> it's been fun, Steve, and uh, uh, I'm sorry I didn't um, – put the last part of it up on um, uh, Facebook and if you send me the the MP4 I can get the last part of it up on Facebook uh huh I'll be able to when I uh, turn the radio stream off oh great great okay so you've got some time to help Sherry get going mm -hmm. and um, thank you so much for your uh, devotion to duty and uh I know you have things going on too, and so do I. And we're just gonna, we're just gonna cope because that's all we, that's what we have to do. All right, I'll play your song after you hang up here. So, oh, okay, thank you very much. All right, Bye. all right.